Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with counselor for Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, Crystal Froze. But before we get into today's interview, we'd like to remind you to hit that subscribe button if you can. So that way you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews on the Cross Border Interviews. Now, on to the show. Counselor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with the basic question, though, that I start all my interviews off, and you're no exception to that first question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Crystal? Well, <clears throat> I would think that most people's answers are probably pretty much the same you know politics was a conversation around the, the dinner table uh, maybe they had parents who were involved in the community um, who were pretty active in that um, I think it kind of surfaces through the your own family values um, probably one of the key memories I have about thinking about politics was um, after I turned um, 18 of course we had an election here in Moose Jaw and it would be my first time to vote. And there was actually a referendum around um, a library. We have this beautiful historic library, but they wanted to build a brand new one. And our library uh, has the most marble in it, except for the legislature in Regina. So it, it's just a, an incredible piece of architecture. And, um, and uh, my high school is a couple blocks away. So I spent a lot of time in that library. And I just couldn't imagine um, them building something even more beautiful than this. So um, I really rallied around uh, the cause and, um, and of course, voted to, to keep the library. And I think that's when I really recognized the power of voting and of, and of our community. And um, so, but I mean, I come from a family, very political, always had talked about politics. Um, and then I actually went to university and took local government authority. Um, thinking I might be uh, want to be a city administrator. And then I found out how hard that job is. <laughs> and uh, then my, my dad said, well, what are you going to do with all this education? Uh, the, all this money you spent on this. And, and I was like, well, I don't know. And he said, well, why don't you run for city council? <laughs> and I said, he said, at least you could use, you know, what you've learned in a very practical way. And so then I ran and I ran for city council. So there's a lot to digest there, and I want to start with uh, young Crystal, if you don't mind, for two seconds. You talk about the dinner table and how politics is often discussed around the dinner table. But in my conversations with municipal councillors or even with regular people from across this country, it's never municipal politics that's discussed at the dinner table. It's traditionally provincial, what's going on in the legislature, who your MLA is, or what's going on in Ottawa, and who we hate right now as prime minister or leader of the opposition or so on and so forth. It's traditionally never the municipal level that's often talked about. For you, was that a conversation around the dinner table, do you remember? Well, um, my dad, um, actually, in uh, in the early 1990s, um, which sounds so old when you say it now, but um, uh, the council of the day, the city council of the day, wanted to give themselves here in Moose Jaw um, a 50% raise in their salaries uh, with zero consultation with the community. And, um, and you're completely right. Around our supper table, it was always federal government, provincial government until this happened. And my dad was like, this, this is, you know, whether, whether it's deserving or not, there is, has been no consultation with the taxpayers. And um, this was coming out of the eighties from the, from the prairies and, you know, we we're in recession. Um, and it was, it was pretty tough times during that time. So he, um, he engaged um, a bunch of people in the community and they ended up having a, um, a town hall meeting. Um, he ended up being on the national news. It was packed. There's so many people there that all the way out the door, down the street, um, and people were angry. And he went in front of city council a couple of times. There's still uh, videos of that out there of him. Bill Shires is, it was my dad's name. And he just wanted consultation. And even when he was speaking in front of uh, council, he wasn't critiquing the fact that they wanted this, but he said, you need to have some type of committee that vets this with the citizens and that and they ended up withdrawing the motion i think they only gave themselves maybe a three percent raise uh at that time um 
so municipal politics for a couple of years is pretty hot and heavy <laughs> in in my house and in the conversations around the supper table. What drew you to municipal politics? You talk about how you went to university for the local government, uh, of course, but you ultimately have to make the decision about where you're going to put your name on the ballot. What was it about the local arena that you said your voice, your uh, opinions would be best suited there? Because you could have chosen many different ways uh, through provincial or even federal, but you chose municipally. And we will talk about the school board uh, trustee position in two seconds as well, because in 2020, you do become that. But what made you decide municipal first? Well, all due respect to fed, to our federal and provincial leaders, um, but they have to toe a party line. And um, and I'm not so good at that. Uh, um, if I disagree with something, I, I really feel strongly to speak up on behalf of the citizens. And, and party politics, you know, it's really very much about um, their, their overall package view on things. Um, and so... I just feel like municipal politics, I can hold them accountable and I can applaud them as well for the good things that they're doing on both sides. But also municipal politics, um, you are making decisions that directly affect your neighbors like that immediately. And you also hear responses from them immediately. Um, so I think we're held even in, you know, in a closer scrutiny, maybe not on some of the bigger issues that you hear from media, but I can I can make things better for my community, you know, on a Monday night uh, with a vote, um, and and to me that's a pretty powerful, uh, positive way to make things better for for the city that I, I grew up in. Recently, I had the pleasure of listening to a conversation between yourself and Regina Mayor uh, Sandra Masters for yes. the Saskatchewan Muni uh, podcast. And I was listening. Yeah, to I was that in and- your shoes. I was in your <laughs> shoes doing the interviewing and hosting part. Hats off to you, Chris. It's not, it's not as easy and smooth as you make it look. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, but you talk about how municipal government is the local government in that podcast, in that episode with uh, uh, Sandra Masters, the mayor. And you talk about how the decisions you make, like you just said, impact the next day. Does that weigh on your decisions that you make at council when you're in that council chambers and you're making decisions and you know the next day these these changes that you are implementing or voting on are going to impact your community? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, because the buck truly stops right there at the council table. Um, and then, you know, then our staff go forth and, and kind of make it happen. But it, it, it also um, puts pressure on when something doesn't pass, because, you know, if, if I'm voting for something and it doesn't pass, um, that weighs on me, that weighs on me as well. Um, so uh, and, uh, you know, we have we have um, uh, groups of citizens who come to us to, you know, in council chambers to bring their issues and uh, and to address th- those things. So it's really, you know, there's a lot of FaceTime that happens there. I spend a lot of time on my phone listening to people's um, issues, um, you know, all the common ones with roads and garbage and, and that kinds of things, but also other things um, that, that make a difference in, in their lives. You know, quality of life is pretty important too. And that, that there's lots of things that happen um, under the municipality's purview uh, that make your city better that sometimes people don't often think about. You know, we talk lots about infrastructure, lots and lots about pipes and roads and and that. But um, it's also parks and recreation and um, and uh, designs and and zoning and and really, really, for me, interesting things, maybe a yawn or two for others. (laughs) What was the what was the issue that you got involved in? When you decided at the end of the day that you wanted to put your name forward, because you you have to make a decision, you have to decide this is the right time for Crystal to put their name for for her to put her name forward. Was there an issue going on in the community that you said, this is the time, this is the moment right here, right now? You talk about how your dad got involved and he didn't get involved electively, but he got involved when the uh, consultation wasn't happening. You said you, you first remember voting in that uh, election when, around the library. What was the moment when you said, okay, now is the time for Crystal to get involved and put her name on the ballot? Well, Mushta is my hometown, but I haven't always lived here. I lived for about 15 years in in the Okanagan and British Columbia. 
And um, and so they were quite further ahead in a lot of different things. So when I moved back here, and actually in 2011, I was asked by a couple of friends to run. And I was like, no, I'm just, you know, just kind of back and kind of getting settled again. And so in 2016, by that time, I'd, I'd been on our um, uh, a city advisory committee for environment. And intermittently when I was coming, would be coming home to visit and that, um, I, I'm a, a runner. I like to get out and run on the trails and, and I was beautiful area ran, to run um, in the moose jaw. <laughs> yes, it is. Yep. Beautiful. And, um, but there was this, um, uh, basically a water pipe underneath a bridge, um, that was depositing chlorinated potable water into, uh, Plaxons Lake. And this had been going on for, oh, five years. And not just drip, drip, drip. I'm talking like spurting water into a freshwater stream. And nobody was doing anything about this. And and uh, and if this was in British Columbia, there would have been tents set up and people protesting about this, right? Because chlorinated water into freshwater is not a good mix. Um, and so then I started taking kind of a closer look around at things in my city and um, and things that really needed some attention. and um, And... But that one really kind of sparked me, it, you know, it'd been going on for years and I, and it wasn't fun. like, I would call and leave messages and talk to the city manager and ask like, what's going on with this and nothing, nothing was moving. So I think that was kind of one of the key things that is like, if they're, if they're not, if they're not getting permission or addressing an issue to me that was significant and visual, what else is being missed um and uh and maybe city staff aren't giving the aren't being given the tools to to really do a really good job here and uh, you, and that's really what kind of sparked it yeah now you've been on council for uh almost two terms now you were just re recently re-elected in 2020 what was the biggest learning curve because being an observer of politics being an observer of what's going on, on the outside is different than actually being on the inside and making those decisions for those because Saskatchewan's heading to an election a municipal election here next year for those who are thinking about putting their name on their ballot what advice would you give someone to to look at or even consider before putting their name on the ballot because you've done it you've been reelected so you must be doing something right so what do, what are you doing right that other people can take from you and say okay if i want to be a successful counselor this is what i need to do well um it, it was very refreshing when i was reelected in, in 2020 to see the new counselors come on and them all 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 of them thinking this was not what i thought it was going to be because we went right from the election right into budget yep um and so i would say um uh, for CDR size, our our packages are you know our our, um, our our packages that we get from our reports from our staff are averaging a hundred pages. So if you're not a reader, um, uh, I would suggest that you don't get into municipal politics. Um, and even smaller communities, I think it's even more important because there's you know there's so much more um, kind of pressure that goes on in a smaller community because you don't have quite as many resources as you do in the larger cities. Um, and budget. Um, all of the financials uh, are always available online on the website, and you need to be up to date on what our city is doing and where where the city is spending their money. And you need to be able to understand reading line by line things. I mean, I came into municipal politics already having some education through my university experience, also being on a city advisory committee, so understanding a little bit about how the staff works and the, and the org organizational chart um, as well. But there, you know, it's um, it's a it's a it's a it's a lots of cogs in the machine, um, so to speak. So um, really becoming familiar, especially with the budget. I mean, it's not just numbers on a page to me when I look at a budget. It is. It is, you know, uh, services that we're providing. So it, it's um, everything from removing snow to picking up garbage to, you know, swimming lessons um, to mowing lawns, uh, you know, to spraying trees, you know, um, to infrastructure, to the water main, to like to everything. When you're looking at the budget, it's not just this is a line. And then it's also jobs because we, you know, we employ people. So the budget is much more than just trying to balance things out at the end, it's the impact that you're going to have, not just today, but for years to come. 
because that's how you know that's what really governs your decision it's where are you going to put your money you, so i would say just, to anybody yeah. go ahead <laughs> sorry I was just going to say, so I would say to anybody, if you're going to run for any level of government, provincial, federal, or municipal, you better dive into that budget because that is what, it, that's what drives the decisions. You just listed off a range of issues that uh, municipalities are dealing with, but it, 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 it sh doesn't shock me, but it, 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 it perked my interest that municipalities are not just dealing with the traditional municipal issues anymore the infrastructure the water the water the roads the uh parks the trees the uh, grass the playgrounds they're dealing with other issues as well and whether that be uh, uh health education uh, even federal issues and your job as a counselor is to be sure that you're aware of what's going on in your community but also be aware of what people are talking about because you may have random things show up at that council meeting that you have to be uh, aware of, but engaged with and understand what people are thinking about. How do you do that? How do you prepare for a council meeting where you get a package, but you can never be 100% sure on what's going to come to you because there might be delegations, there might be people who are coming to talk about certain issues, and they may fall outside of the jurisdiction of the municipal government. For you, how do you balance the municipal jurisdictions with the realities that the municipal jurisdiction is also a provincial jurisdiction and a federal jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, for when I get my package, depending upon what it is, I mean, if it's something within my city, uh, you know, an issue in a neighborhood, I always go drive by, I make phone calls, I try to get both sides of the information, as well as our staff are wonderful at the, the amount of information they provide in the report. But if we're talking about um, staying in our own lane, kind of thing, is that kind of what you mean? Chris? Yeah, but, you know, no, because, I, because I want to know or... because... Your residents will come up to you probably on a regular basis and ask you questions about what's going on in the community. They might have concerns about a hospital issue or an education mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. as a counselor. And I, I say this mm -hmm. as a counselor. How do you balance w your role as a counselor with understanding that health is a provincial issue, education mm -hmm. is a provincial issue, but residents yeah. don't care about that. They want you to address no, the issue yeah. that they come to you with. So how do you yeah. stay in your lane with understanding that they don't, the resident doesn't care if you're a municipal, federal, or provincial politician. If they come to you, yeah. they want you to fix it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, COVID really pulled the curtain back on whose lane is whose. Um, you know, speaking from somebody who's a city councillor and a, a school board trustee, where a lot of the things that we felt were provincial and federal um, a jurisdiction were handed down to us to make decisions on. And uh, and we took a lot of flack from communities about, about that, lots of flack. Um, it was a very, very stressful time. But, you know, when somebody comes up to me, and I'll use this as an issue because I know, um, having watched a couple of your um, podcasts that you know, the um, the homelessness issue and um, addictions uh, that we're experiencing, even in smaller cities like my own, um, are an issue. And so um, uh, we don't have funding when we're a city of our size for these types of things. And so it's important to be in touch with MLAs, with your own MLAs and your own MPs to advocate for social supports. So when I've been approached by people who, uh, you know, see what's going on in our city and and uh, and um, want to help in some way, and that I bring those issues directly to our MPs and our and our MLAs and say, here's some of the issues that are going on, and I've had meetings with both on on the situation that's here in the city. Um, How often are you yeah. getting approached about other jurisdictional issues? Is it a regular occurrence? Do do people and I and I ask this question, then I'm gonna sort of preface this question by saying, do people understand the levels and the jurisdictions that people have when it comes to issues that are related to different levels of governments? Because you talk about COVID and how it pulled back the curtain, but COVID was a unique experience. And I think we can all admit that. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that we can all go look at and go, it was uncharted territories and we just didn't know what was going on. But outside of that, outside of the realm of COVID. COVID-19, do you see a lot of issues coming to you or uh, being you're being approached by uh, residents of Moose Jaw to say, hey, can we talk about this provincial issue or this federal issue or no? Um, uh, sometimes, but, you know, people are pretty well informed um, about who does what. 
you know, the, on, this, uh, um, you know, they're like, we have a pretty feisty, feisty uh, citizens in our, in our city that are pretty well informed on most issues and kind of understand who looks after what um, and that, but, you know, f- it still doesn't still, still doesn't um, necessarily, um, uh, you know, omit my role in that either. And that, and sometimes people are just venting. Um, and we both kind of commiserating about uh, things that that we believe are provincial and federal issues that are not getting attention because they they're not you know maybe our leaders aren't getting along with each other for whatever reason, um, and and or they're focusing on something that really um, might not necessarily be relevant to the day to day life of their citizens and that you know and and the media has kind of grabbed a hold of that, um, and so we kind of commiserate together. But as I said, I part of part of a role as a municipal leader is to advocate. Um, to both both those levels of government on issues um, that are brought to me. So, you are, uh, uh, and I say this with respect, but you are a part time counselor. You technically you you make the job what you want it to be. You're not full time. I don't believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here. And Mustra, you're not full time counselors, right? No. Okay. No. But the job is a full time job. Let's be honest. The job is a full time job. <laughs> the it job is a full time job. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found the balance of being just Crystal and Counselor Frost? Froze. Froze. Like cold. Froze. froze. Yes, froze. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I wanted to say Frost for some reason. I was like, she said cold, so I'm going to say Froze, Frost. But have you found the balance between being Crystal and Counselor Froze difficult to navigate? Because I can imagine there's days that you just want to go out and just be crystal with your family. But there's also days that you know, if you go to the the grocery store, you're getting stopped and you're getting stopped for not just 10 minutes, but you're getting stopped for 20 minutes, 15, an hour potentially about issues that are going on in the community. How do you balance that personal and public life of a municipal counselor? Because you don't go to Regina to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community 24-7. Well, yeah. And like we said earlier, if I make a decision on Monday night, uh, it's in the news and I'm in the grocery store. And if someone is not happy or someone's <laughs> actually happy about it, you know, chances are I'm probably going to hear about it right there in front of the milk uh, in the grocery store. But um, honestly, I think um, I'm a like, I don't, I don't, there's no different faces I wear. Um, so what you see is what you get. Um, so uh, I'm I'm a member of of this community just like everybody else is. I've told people like I put my garbage out just like you do. Um, I have the same the same um, concerns that that other people do. So I think when I'm meeting with the public and my husband quite jo- he jokes just like you said. You know, if I go off to the grocery store to get something, um, he's not he's not too worried if I'm not back in a half an hour because <laughs> he knows pretty much what's what's probably going to happen. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a part-time job if you want to get anything accomplished. And, uh, when an opportunity arises for somebody who happens to see in the grocery store and wants to bring an issue up, um, you know, you know, they're concerned enough to actually stop you who is a stranger, even though you're an elected person and, and bring their issue to you in the aisle, um, right there. So I have a lot of respect for people who do that as I do for people who bring things to our council chambers, that's a pretty intimidating place, you know, to be up there speaking in front of us in the council chambers. Um, and that and I have a deep respect for people who, who um, feel strongly enough about their community to bring attention to something that they're concerned about. So I fully respect that, um, you know, uh, but it's also nice for my husband and I to take off to Saskatoon for a weekend where nobody really knows you and doesn't really care. And so you kind of get a, you know, a couple of days of of uh, a time away but yeah i i never begrudge anybody for trying to have a conversation with me i i signed up for that i you know um and uh and and i get i get what that's all about so this is probably the weirdest question i will have ever asked on this the show but i think it's important to ask this from the conversation that we've only had for the last 23 minutes you talked about how your father was angry that consultation wasn't happening back in the 90s of around the uh, the increase in pay for counselors. What would your dad say about your consultation skills in the city of Moose Jaw today? It's funny that you asked that question because um, when I got elected, one of the things that I 
also felt was lacking in um, in in the the communication between our municipal governance and our citizens was we had all of these incredible groups in our city, organizations, nonprofits um, that that the city funds that comes from taxpayers' money, and nobody was really getting to see what they were doing. Um, so when I when I became elected, you know, I was sitting on lots of committees. Um, we have like the art gallery, the library. Um, the Mushta Exhibition Company. There's lots of lots of um, lots of organizations doing really good work um, that the city funds. And so one of the motions that I made was to have these organizations come before council um, in early in the fall, prior to budget, and tell us all of the things that they've been accomplishing in their year. And um, and it freaked a few of them out because they thought that you know we we're going to be scrutinizing. Uh, what they were doing. Um, but I really knew the exact opposite was going to happen having sat on some of them, like our art gallery. The the uh, museum uh, and art gallery here in Mushta is actually rated at level one, um, or maybe it's, a, maybe it's a letter A. Anyways, it's, it's very highly regarded as one of the art galleries in Canada, that if you're an artist, you want to have your exhibitions there. That's how highly regarded it is across the nation. And I knew our city council did not know that. <laughs> um, and our taxpayers' money is, is going to help fund uh, their good work. And same with the, the library. We found out, obviously, during COVID, it's one of the highest used buildings in our city. Um, again, another thing to um, for them to come back. And the digital... Uh, um, capabilities that they have for all different types of programming um, was pretty amazing. The Moose Exhibition Company, been here over 100 years, um, incredible equestrian center. All these things were never highlighted at a city council meeting before the budget. So just back to the way I, I was telling you about how I look at a budget. So when you're looking at, at funding things, um, uh, that's how I see things. Like these are, this is money going into these into the art gallery, into the library um, that are doing incredible things. So if you're thinking about taking money back, you better have a really good understanding of what they are actually doing. So now we have, um, I think at our last year, we had uh, 14 or 15 organizations that we fund come before us before budget. And it's just, to me, it, it's one of the best meetings ever because holy smokes, they bring PowerPoints, um, they, they bring all kinds of information. Uh, the exhibition ground brings their burrowing owl. They have a burrowing owl center. So they bring a little owl. Like it's an, it's an amazing experience to sit through to see all of these nonprofit organizations that the, our city funds and all the incredible work they're doing. And then they also bring some of their challenges too, which also feeds into how we address our budget. So that was a big thing for me for public consultation is to um, is to have a connection between city council and our community and uh, that was that's really been a game changer I think for our budget. I want to turn to my second segment now and I want to preface this conversation by saying this this is a conversation between the councillor and myself this is not a motion of council this is not a direction of council this is the councillor's opinion I need to preface that because I seem to get some emails whenever I ask this question but councillor in your opinion as of recording this episode what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges that face the city of Moose Jaw today? Well, <clears throat> we are in probably the biggest infrastructure renewal in 100 years in our city. You know, uh, the amount of work that needs to be done, um, things that were that hadn't been accomplished way before I became a uh, city councillor, because there was no idea of what asset management was. That was never a concept. Um, and so we are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on um, water security on our uh, one of the biggest uh, projects is we're 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 partners with Regina on the Buffalo Pound water treatment plant and that's a that's a huge huge project uh, building basically a brand new one and it's our only source of water and then we're replacing all of the um, cast iron water mains in our city um, and uh, and then we have um We've just finished uh, uh, doing our Northeast uh, Reservoir, but we also have um, a lift station for our sewer system. And we put out a, and here's here's where I feel is one of the biggest uh, um, challenges we have right now. We just put it out uh, last year and the, um, 
the uh, the quotes that we got back from from um, the developers to redo that were so astronomical that we couldn't we couldn't proceed. And this is a sewer lift station that, that if this goes down, it will be catastrophic in our city. It is the only sewer lift station that we have that that pushes all the sewer up to our <clears throat> to our uh, treatment plant. And um, we put in for federal uh, funding and didn't get anything for it. So it is without our partners, our provincial and federal partners and their understanding of this, you know, and, you know, I don't know how you reel in the, the cost of things. Um, I really don't know how you how you do that. But um, but like it's just it's it's a project that's not going to go forward without without some type of some type of federal support okay um first off and i hate to use this word but that's shitty that's really shitty that that's, <laughs> that's going <laughs> and that's chris brown saying that not the counselor just fyi yeah. um I, I had to get that out of the way secondly um you're not alone on that issue. Municipalities across Canada are facing infrastructure deficits. There's a lot of aging out of infrastructure. Asset management is great, but asset management can only tell you when things are going to go down and not pay for the things that are going to go down. So how do you and how does the city of Moose Jaw go this alone until the federal and provincial governments come to the table with funding? Because if that lift station goes down and i god forbid it ever does you guys are up creek without a paddle so how do you guys plan for the future while understanding that infrastructure is needed that projects need it but you also have to balance the needs and wants of your community because if you put all your money there you're not fixing potholes you're not potentially increasing mm -hmm. service levels at the pool the library so how do you balance the needs and wants of your community with the understanding that infrastructure is important and you need to fix major projects that cost millions if not billions of dollars yeah well um uh for a project like this you know advocacy is going to be pretty important um with our with our mlas here in our city um <clears throat> we're we're pretty lucky in the fact that um uh we've been pre pretty diligent in our reserves that we have and we actually have investments we have quite a, a really healthy investment portfolio and um we have a, an excellent uh finance director brian acker who's um probably one of the the longest standing um uh directors we have in our city right now and um and uh he really knows his stuff and that so uh, we'll be moving into a strategic plan actually on uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks prior to our budget, and it's on it's top of our list to talk about how to how to do exactly that. So whether it's a um, a wait a waiting game, um, talking about you know what we can do to basically put band aids on on the facility to continue to work while we advocate, um, whether it's you know borrowing. Um, you know, and hopefully those interest rates will will start to go down. Um, and maybe it's a mixture of utilizing some of our investments, some of um, some borrowing and advocacy as we go forward. So it's really qu quite a mixed mixed bag um, to kind of get the job done. Um, so yeah, so it it's a there's lots of I guess there's lots of things that kind of play into a decision. Um, of of how to address that, but we're we're actually fairly lucky because we've been pretty good with financially and that. But um, while this still... is going on, <clears throat> while this these infrastructure projects are going on, you you are probably best aware that people will still come to you asking for money, whether it be for a project, whether it be for upgrades to pools, whether it be upgrades to service levels at the library, uh, whether it be street repairs, whether it be a sidewalk in front of someone's house. You, at the end of the day, have to look at that budget. And I know you're going into the budget, so we won't talk about the future budget, but going into going past, like going to the past for a second, how were you able to balance what the city wants with what the individual wants? Because 
you're there to represent the city. You're there to look for look at the city as a whole and move it forward. But you can't forget about the individual peoples. And I'm going to quote Spock from Star Trek here because it's my favorite quote when it comes to this question. How do you balance the needs of the many with the needs of the few or the one? Because you have to make the decisions. And sometimes at the end of the day, you have to make decisions that will dedicate or predicate who the winners and losers are when it comes to the budget. Is it hard to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, it sure is because like right now we have an outdoor pool that is in dire need as well. And it's loved by the citizens of our city. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of been a rite of passage for a lot of kids. We have this huge tower you jump off um, and it's in our, it's in Crescent Park, which is the kind of the jewel of our, our city, this beautiful park right in the middle of our city. And, um, but it is on its last leg. It's been leaking. Uh, and it's old, old infrastructure. And so we've, again, have applied for funding to help us with that. And, and it, it didn't get it didn't get funding. And so we're going to be balancing as we move into the into our budget season. How do we prioritize this? And maybe it's a bit of a shell game uh, a little bit, too. Um, uh, but then, the, you know, rarely have I ever found um, since I've been on council that there's like one um one person with one sole need. Um, usually that person's uh, uh, concern or whatever is actually there's a lot more people that it it impacts and that, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun, so to speak. Um, and uh, uh, there's not a lot of singular interests that come before us. You know, it's usually one person who's brave enough to raise um, a question that everybody's been thinking about, but nobody's really been brave enough to bring it up. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's, it's really juggling between things that make quality of life, um, like the recreation side of things and absolutely essential services and trying to figure out how to fund these in, as you said, like infrastructure, uh, deficit, um, and that, so it is, and also having to remind people that I am one vote around the table. So, um, you know, there's there's six councillors and a mayor and the mayor, although is the is the person who has, you know, who speaks on behalf of council and speaks on behalf of the city, they still only have one vote. So there's a lot of conversations and debate that has to happen around that table to move things forward, especially if you get, you know, dramatically different personalities or dramatically different values that can make things very interesting. Yeah, I can, Im I, I can imagine. Um, I want to turn to my last subject because I'm cautious of time here. But before I do that, I want to just say I was just recently in Moose Jaw. I asked about 10 people in, at one of your parks what the biggest issue is. And about eight of them said we need a new pool. So when you talked about a pool, I was like, oh, she's actually talking to people and they know this was in the height <laughs> of the summer. So it might have been just the issue. If I was in the winter, it might have been snow removal. But the pool did come up. Um, as I said, I have just been to Moose Jaw. I have toured your beautiful city. And I love talking about this topic because it's important to me. Tourism. I think tourism mm -hmm. is much needed. I think tourism is a thing that we don't do as much as we should. And I think municipalities play a role in promoting tourism because I think there's hidden gems in every community, no matter how big or small. So, Councillor Crystal. In your opinion, what are the hidden gems? And I say hidden gems as in, I don't want to know about the moose. I don't want to know about the mines. Yes, you could talk about them. But what are the gems of Moose Jaw that people need to see if they come there this summer or next summer? Well, <clears throat> if you never leave the Trans-Canada Highway, you will always think the prairies are flat and and full of farmland truly don't you think like when you're traveling to trans canada so um uh and i mean i've lived in british columbia and um so british columbia has the mountains and you know some of the in most incredible nature and that so it's it's pretty important to highlight things that we have here and i think one of the things that is probably the biggest gem and i would i would say that i don't think there's very many municipalities in our province that have this almost the entire south end of our city is a park and um, and it uh, uh, there's probably close to um, 800 acres of parkland 
which is the south part of our city. So from Waccamaw, which lots of people know because they see the boardwalk when you come down, but um, it that our parkland actually follows and trails follow the Mushtar River all the way um, the entire part of our south of our town. So you can access that park from Waccamaw. Um, you can access it from the 4th Avenue uh, south. You can access it from the 7th Avenue. You can access it from the 9th Avenue. Um, and it is parkland all the way across. There are trails that go all the way back um, and actually meet up to the property that begins to be 15 wing, um, which is, of course, the home of the snowbirds, which I absolutely will plug because there's not another uh, community in this nation that has the snowbirds. This is their home. And um, and so that is absolutely a gem. But I would say it's probably our park and it's a it's a four season park. There's you can cross country ski in there. I cross country ski on the river all winter long down there. Um, I, I pull up my mountain bike, I mountain bike on there. I, I have a membership at our canoe and kayak club. I kayak on the river all summer long. Um, and it's a real gem, absolutely a real gem. Where do you go in the community to just decompress? You talk about canoeing, kayaking, but where do you go to just let it all go after a long day of meetings, after a long day of work? What's, what's your escape in your community? Um, probably running on the trails. Yeah. I would say that's probably you got it. You know, like you got, fresh air is just it's the cure for for any stress that you have. Where there's cold fresh air or hot fresh air, because believe me, we have we have both. You know, twenty below and thirty above, and and everything else. But I just I also do want to just comment uh, one thing about um, tourism that I think is really important to know. And our our city went underwent a couple of years back kind of a whole identity um kind of a search for who we are and tourism really is that's that's what tour, tourism is 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 finding out what the city's identity is and we went through the whole whole thing when we had um i've seen um doug griffiths i'm sure you know who he is the 13 ways to clear your community and he spoke at suma well i, I approached him after his, his talk and asked him if he does strategic plans for cities and so we actually ended up hiring him and went through his program and and um out of that came the notoriously most, you know, Canada's most notorious city, which is Mushta. And <clears throat> as I said, tourism is really about finding what your identity is in your city. So ours is obviously our architecture and our downtown, which is unlike any other city. Um, we have, you know, uh, Crescent Park, which is also, it's kind of like a whole combination of things. Crescent Park, which is in their downtown, all the architecture, everything's walkable space you know you can even walk from downtown it's like a 15 minute walk from downtown to all of the parkland in the south end um and so finding out what your identity i think is pretty important and then of course tourism feeds into economic development i mean how many times have you have you been on vacation and and uh, looked at the place and thought geez i could i could live there you know and i'm sure that's what how a lot of people end up uh, moving to a to a new city is by having visited it for the first time I will just put a special plug in for the people at the Moose Jaw Travel Visitor Information Center. Mm -hmm. They have got to be the nicest people that I dealt with while I was traveling across. Don't get me wrong. A lot of visitor informations are great, but I walked in there. They were helpful. They were basically on me trying to figure out if I wanted to buy a sweater or what, what I wanted to buy. So <laughs> I appreciate that. And they gave me great instructions to how to get to the downtown, uh, how to get to some of the, their hidden gems, because I, whenever I go into visitor information centers, centers i ask what their hidden gems are so i i i, I could cannot speak highly enough of your visitor information center because they helped me tour around your community and they gave me a better understanding and you are right you have probably one of the best architectural communities that i've ever mm -hmm. seen in a very long time so <laughs> i i just want to <laughs> say just wanted to give you that sort of uh smoke there because that's awesome but, Get on Moose Jaw. Um, I want to end and on the this trolley. Question. Did you did you ride the trolley, Chris? Did you ride the trolley? I didn't because it was not working oh. that day. I went in and oh I was my. like, "Oh, is the trolley working?" They're like, "No, uh, the person wasn't there, or something was wrong with it." I wasn't one hundred percent sure. They they sort of alluded around, but no, it was just parked in the uh, the parking lot. So I was like, "Oh, I thought now I we have two. On. Yeah, oh. now we have two. So yeah, okay. so next time you come back, 
I'm sure yes. one of the other will be working. <laughs> they, probably the other one was working, but I was like, is that trolley working? And they probably just assumed that I wanted to go on that one. But anyway, I'll be back in 2024 <laughs> when I come to SUMA conference in 2024 in Regina. Awesome. Wonderful. I want to end on this question though, because I am cautious of time and we're at the, almost at the 45 minute mark. So I have, I just want to ask this question. We'll jump out. In your opinion, what makes Moose Jaw such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family counselor? Hmm. I would say that we have uh, everything you need here um, from the quality of life. And we're, we're kind of like a, um, a small town with big city amenities are the two things. And um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's a safe place, um, which nowadays I think is also something uh, people are considering. And you, you really don't, you know, you really don't have to leave the city to get what you need as far as shopping goes. And, um, and you'd be hard pressed finding a more beautiful downtown. And there is always something going on in the city entertainment wise and activity wise um, and sports wise. Uh, we have a baseball team, we have a hockey team. Um, there's always something going on in our city. So the quality of life here is uh, pretty extraordinary. Councillor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking 45 minutes out of your day to do this. It's always a pleasure. And I, and I say this with respect every single time that I say it. Thank you. Thank you for serving your community. Thank you for moving your city forward, moving your community forward. I don't think municipal politicians get their due, and I think it's high time that they do. So thank you so much for doing what you do and making Moose Jaw, but also the province of Saskatchewan, a better place. So thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. And, and um, should you want to uh, create a category for uh, school board trustees, which is one of the other levels of governance that um, people don't really understand. Love to come and talk to you about um, about what school board uh, uh, does and accomplish here in our in our province as well too. Well, we didn't I have think, enough time today. It's a, no, we it's didn't. A whole other topic. I think I think it's high time because it, it, you yeah. must be reading my big giant board of things that I'm doing right now because in November. We're launching a weekly show where we're just going to be talking to uh, a school board trustees because uh, school board trustees want to come and talk as well. So I will certainly reach back out and talk about school board trustees and how how a counselor balances the life of a school board trustee and a city counselor. So thank you so much, Crystal, for doing this. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission. As we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like today's episode. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes and is on our website. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep driving and delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, remember, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.